An IBM computer named Watson defeated two human contestants last night on the game show Jeopardy. The victory was a milestone for the field of artificial intelligence, or AI. Watson. What is flowers for Algernon? Yes. U.S. Geographic nicknames for 1,200. This town is known as Sin City, and its downtown is Glitter Gulch. Watson. What is Las Vegas? Correct. The technology behind Watson could one day be used to enhance our daily lives. Joining me now from Philadelphia, Brian Christian. He wrote a cover story in artificial intelligence for this month's Atlantic Magazine. <coughs> He's also the author of a forthcoming book called The Most Human Human. From San Francisco, Richard Waters. He is the West Coast Bureau Chief of the Financial Times. I am pleased to have both of them here to talk about this sort of fascinating subject. What does this say, this uh, highly publicized event between IBM and Jeopardy contestants? Well, Charlie, like, uh, like all things in artificial intelligence, uh, you, it, it means everything and nothing. Um, it's always very easy when you see a demonstration, a proof of uh, how far technology's got, to sort of leap forward that extra mile and see, you know, all the way to the end of the road and the potential that it opens up. And, uh, you know, you have to pull yourself back and you have to say, you know, this is, this is quite a striking thing, um, but it's not everything. And so what it shows is uh, that something people thought you know, a few years ago wouldn't be possible for a couple of decades has come to pass, which is a machine can actually, you know, start to understand language, a sort of language, um, you know, that we're talking right now, and can, can use that to plumb sort of general intelligence, general knowledge. Um, and, you know, to, to all of us, that seems a very simple thing, but it is actually quite a massive leap forward. Brian? I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think one of the fascinating things that we're seeing is uh, the history of artificial intelligence has really come up with a lot of counterintuitive ideas about what's easy and what's hard. So when we look at Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter, we're impressed by what they know. Um, but for the IBM team, it wasn't encoding all of that knowledge that was a challenge. It was figuring out how to use natural language. Um, so the things about Jeopardy contestants that we take for granted uh, turn out to be a lot of the challenge. So I think in some ways these contests throw a lot of really interesting light on, you know, what's impressive about being a human being. Now, is Watson significantly more powerful than, you know, the kind of computer that most of us use? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's, yeah. it's an entire system that's taken four years and $30 million to build, all uh, geared towards one single task, if you like. And there have been, you know, 25 to 30 PhDs working on this, some of the smartest people in their fields in the world. So um, if you can imagine all that brain power brought to bear on playing one simple quiz show, um, then, you know, that gives you a sense of, of how far they've got. And they've had to make breakthroughs um, not just in writing algorithms, you know, the sort of basic tasks that determine how this computer works, but in the hardware as well, and how you line up you know, these masses of processors and things to, to sort of all geared towards answering one simple question. It's quite a feat. And what's the, Brian, what's the next part of the evolution of artificial intelligence? Well, I think it's really interesting. I mean, um, I would say, you know, we saw that Watson was particularly good mm. at questions where the language was really explicit. And we know that intuitively from using Google. So mm. the questions with uh, the Beatles lyrics where you had to fill in the blank and it was, hey, Jude, um, those, it seemed like, were a real kind of slam dunk for Watson. And the ones where the language was a little bit more circuitous, so, for example, the Voldemort question, um, because Voldemort is a character in Harry Potter whose name is unmentionable, um, you present the computer with this real problem of having to figure out what of the events in the book he's responsible for. Um, and so, for me, there's this interesting parallel between AI and things like the law, um, where the, the situations where humans try to use language um, in a very explicit way present easier challenges. And the areas where we try to use language is sometimes in a deliberately difficult way. Um, so Steven Pinker, for example, uh, has a really interesting chapter in his book on the linguistics of bribes, threats, and seductions. So what are those situations in human language where we're trying not to be fully understood? I think that's still a ways off. That'll be a few steps away. Where do they see the future? And how fast do they see the velocity of creating 
you know, uh, something that would stun all of us today? You know, I, I think it's going to come remarkably quickly. Um, and, you know, the thing about artificial intelligence or the, the disciplines that go together to make up artificial intelligence is that they, you know, they each move at a different pace and they take leaps. And we're at the, the threshold of one of those leaps. And so let me tell you what I think is the, you know, the real significance. We're talking about language here a lot. But actually what Watson's doing is, you know, this IBM machine is doing is taking masses and masses of data. It's taking it from, you know, all domains of human experience, if you like. Um, and it's looking at all that information and it's saying, you know, um, I think there are correlations in here. I think um, if I add this and this together, I can find a, a reason why this happens. Um, and it's learning, it's machine learning. And so when you ask it a question, it's comparing all of these different things that it knows or thinks about and churns very fast and comes up with an answer. And if that answer is wrong, then it goes back and it tries again and it maps different bits of information together. And so what you end up with is a machine that is actually learning, is actually uh, getting closer to finding correlations um, in things that you and I would never even think to look for. And that becomes predictive. Um, you know, take an example. We all know that when it rains a lot, you get more traffic accidents. Um, well, mm. you know, maybe there are other factors that um, help you to predict when accidents will happen. Um, and, and machines like this that can draw on this massive bank of of human knowledge can start to find those patterns uh, and actually start to make predictions. Predictions? Predictions. They can tell you that if, and ind indeed this is what Watson was doing, Watson, uh, or the IBM machine wasn't answering questions on Jeopardy, it was predicting the answer if you like. Um, it was giving a percentage likelihood that a certain uh, answer was, was the right answer to a certain question. So it was actually um, it was never sure of any, anything. It's never sure on anything, this machine, and that's actually its strength. One of the things that the IBM team envisions is that this is the kind of technology that's going to really sit as a kind of intermediary in a lot of human decision-making. So I know they're interested in medical decision-making and that sort of thing. Um, and for me, that's one of the really interesting things about the past few years is that um, we're really already at a point where we're using artificial intelligence to kind of mediate our experience of the world. So when we go on the internet, uh, if you will, we're not, we're not interacting directly through the internet. We're sort of going through this intermediary, which is the AI algorithm at Google. And it's kind of saying to us, well, here, this is what I think you should read. This is what I think you find interesting. Um, so I think that's only going to get more so where you know, and we, and we turn to things like Yelp uh, and Wikipedia and these computerized systems that are telling us, you know, where to eat, uh, what's the best route to take through the city to get there. Um, and I think Watson presents kind of this next step where we may also find ourselves using it to, you know, diagnose medical problems or, I mean, well, the sky may be the limit on that. I don't know, know. You know what's really fascinating about this to me? We did a 12-part brain series on this program and and looking at neuroscience and what it was teaching us about the way the brain goes about with the remarkable achievements that it does. And my assumption is the more we learn about neuroscience, the more we'll be able to advance artificial intelligence. One of the big paradigm shifts uh, in the end of the 20th century was this move from thinking about artificial intelligence in this really strict, logical, deductive way um, to looking at the way the brain actually works, which is a lot more fluid, it's right. non-binary, and the development of these things called neural networks uh, represented a big step forward into looking at domains like face recognition, or right. as one example, exactly. where when you recognize a face, it's not a question of you know checking off a series of logical boxes, it's a kind of impression that you get. Um, and it was definitely neuroscience that helped us kind of push forward into these other domains. Richard, you were going to say? Yeah, I was going to say ab absolutely that it's, uh, in fact, you know, the IBM machine is using this. It's using pattern recognition, if you like. And so rather than um, trying to understand um, basically, you know, try and, trying to link one fact to another fact to another fact and try and map the whole of human knowledge, which is virtually impossible, um, it's trying to recognize patterns where certain facts coexist and, and, and exist together. And so, you know, what, what this machine does is it looks at whole banks of text, whole passages of text, 
uh, and sees that certain words tend to tend to happen in close correlation. And so it's looking for patterns like this and things that fit together. Very much like the human brain is thought to work. But I think the really important thing is, you know, there is no algorithm for the human brain. No one has written that, and it's still a mystery. Uh, this is what, where you ended a big full-page piece in uh, Financial Times. You said, just as Google has become an aid to human memory through sophisticated question-and-answer systems, could eventually come to supplement human thought. And it may be a short step from there to turning over run-of-the-mill brain tasks to digital assistants, just as most mathematics has long been entrusted to calculators. Why bother to follow rudimentary thought process that can easily be outsourced? By that point, machines may not have any greater claim than they do now to true intelligence, but their human creators will have extended their own intellectual functions even further beyond the limits of nature. That's what we hope. You know, the, the downside of all of this is that we outsource our brains, if you like, or more and more of our brain functions to computers, and uh, what we have less turns to mush. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, there's a strong strand of thought out there that actually Google is making us stupid, as uh, Nick Carr, one writer, wrote. Um, and, you know, if you think that, um, that students today don't need to learn the basics, um, then will they learn the more advanced science or will they simply rely on computers to do it for them? And what does it mean if they do that? Mm. Last word to you, Brian. So uh, this is a forward step of, of a, one of the most exciting arenas of, of human endeavor, figuring out uh, how to enhance and understand and, and uh, extend intelligence. I think that's right. And I think it also forms a piece in this kind of long narrative where if you look back on the history of Western thought, humans have always been obsessed with figuring out their special place in creation, you know, what makes humans unique and distinct and special. Um, and, you know, you go back to Aristotle and Descartes, and they're obsessed with figuring out how are we different from animals. And in the 21st century, the question has become, how are we different from machines? And I think it's raising a lot of whole new questions about what it means to be human. And that, for me, is actually pretty exciting. It's extraordinary. I mean, it's, there's no question that is more fascinating, I think, in the realm of science. Uh, Brian's piece is in The Atlantic, Why Machines Have Never Beat the Human Mind. And then and Richard has this piece that was in uh, today's Financial Times called Mind Games, Information Technology. After decades of false dawns, advances in artificial intelligence are at hand, led by a digital quiz show contestant that offer business potentially significant benefits. Thank you both. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah.